Welcome to Highland Park. I'm Joanne Beck, president of the Highland Park Conservancy. The Conservancy is the all-volunteer, not-for-profit partner of Monroe County Department of Parks, which operates and maintains Highland Park, including the Lamberton Conservatory. Highland Park is important as the very first public park in the Rochester and Monroe County Park System. A masterwork of design by Frederick Law Olmsted a landscape designed and built to express the intrinsic scenic beauty of its site and as a showcase of horticulture and a public space to advance the social ideals shared by Olmsted and the Park Commission for human health and well being, social equity, freedom, and happiness. For over 130 years, Highland Park has been a place of extraordinary beauty for everyone to experience every day. In these virtual tours, we'll be exploring the Lamberton Conservatory and the tree and plant collections throughout the park. Our guides include horticultural interpreter Noel Nagel in the conservatory and Monroe County Parks horticulturist Susan Maney on the seasonal park tours. We hope you enjoy this tour. I look forward to seeing you in the park before too long. Good morning. Welcome to Highland Park. My name is Susan Maney, and I'm the horticulturist with the Monroe County Parks Department. This morning, we're gonna take a walk through Highland Park and look at the late spring and early summer flowers. We're starting our tour today at the pansy bed. The pansy bed was planted in 1904, and it is a beloved Rochester tradition in Highland Park. Every year, there's a new design creating a carpet of floral colors with pansies, which are an early spring blooming annual. And it's kept in this bed until the sun and the weather fades it, and then a new annual bed is put in in early June. This year, our pansy bed says MC200, which is a nod to the bicentennial of Monroe County, which Highland Park is a part of Monroe County. Since 1904, these plants have been grown at the park and planted in this bed. There are somewhere between 15 and 20,000 pansies. Depending on how many people we have, it takes between eight and 15 days to plant. It also depends on whether or not it snows in the middle of that planting. It's always completed by the first week of May so that it's ready for the Lilac Festival. In 2015, the Rochester Garden Club donated a substantial amount of money through their centennial celebration of the Garden Club of America to restore this bed and to create all of this beautiful stonework, to add knee walls, and to add an irrigation system, which has been a real boon to the health of the plant. So now we're gonna take a walk and get an overview of the lilacs. I'll take a few minutes to tell you Highland Park has the largest collection of lilacs in North America. Over 22 acres on a south facing hill along Highland Avenue. There are between 12 and 1500 shrubs depending on what season we're in because some die and some are planted and it represents 500 different varieties of lilacs from the early blooming lilacs that start at the end of through the mid-season, which is what you're seeing now, until the late season, with it, which are the Japanese and Chinese hybrids. So we're gonna start our walk, and we're gonna go up through the lilacs, pointing out some of the remarkable trees along the way. So let's take a walk. Just a few lilac facts. This lilac, which depending on whether or not you're wearing sunglasses, looks fairly blue, is a single flowering lilac. It is one of the cultivars that was bred here in Highland Park. Over a course of 100 years, 50 different varieties of lilacs were bred and created and introduced to the trade. That started with John Dunbar, who was our first horticulturist, who was hired in 1891. And the ending of the hybridization program was about 1990 when our greenhouses were taken down and we no longer had the capacity to continue to breed lilacs. 
Lilacs come from the Balkan Peninsula. They are not native to the United States, although they've been here since the 1600s. There are records of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington making gardening notes about their lilacs. I'm stopping at this lilac because it's one of the Russian hybrids, Ketsotiva Moskvi, better known as Beauty of Moscow. And it is a lovely double white lilac very fragrant and it starts with a pink bud and opens into white. Lilacs have seven recognized colors. It starts with white and goes to pink, blue, magenta, violet, purple, and deep purple. So we're going to take a walk and show you some other great examples of lilacs, but I want to take two minutes and have the camera pointed to this large tree that is directly behind the pansy bed. This is our Katsura tree, Circidophyllum japonicum, more than 100 years old. It is a male tree, and it is one of the landmark trees in Highland Park. We'll walk by it again. We're going to take our path this way. If you look through the park at this time of year, it's really obvious the color variations available in lilacs from that bluish color, pure white, to that deep, deep purple, which seems to be the most popular color when we go to sell lilacs. They also have doubling, and this particular lilac is a hose and hose doubler. That means that lilacs have four petals, and hose and hose means there's a set of petals here, and then there's a second set of petals on top of that, and you can get as many as three or four sets of petals depending on the cultivar. We're going to keep going uphill now. I do want to point out, we're at the corner of Highland and Goodman, and right here at the corner is a rock memorial to John Dunbar, who was the first horticulturist hired right after the parks were established. He was hired in 1891, and he worked for the Parks Department for 27 years, I believe. He was a gifted horticulturist who personally introduced 30 different lilacs to the park. His job was monumental. This was a brand new park, and his job was to grow all the plants. Although he did have connections all over Europe, he was a Scotsman, and he imported plants both from Europe and Asia, as well as buying local plants from firms like Elwanger and Berry, and also from the Flushing Nursery on Long Island. I'm stopping at this shrub because although it doesn't look terribly exciting, it is indeed one of the oldest shrubs in the park. It was planted in 1892 and it came from the Parsons Nursery. It was a John Dunbar planting. It was not one of his introductions. Many of the lilacs, you'll often hear the term French lilacs. Those are lilacs that were bred by the Lemoyne Nursery in France. And Victor Lemoyne actually introduced many, many hybrids to the trade to the point where most people thought lilacs, they would call them French lilacs, when in truth, that was just one nurseryman's introductions. Um, some of the most exciting variations in lilacs are now coming from Russia, although we don't have easy access to them right now to add to our collection. We're heading up. If you look off to this side, these are the oldest lilacs. When John Dunbar first started planting Highland Park, he planted right from Goodman Street and started heading east. We're heading north up this hill. So these are some of our oldest lilacs, and some of them are absolutely huge. Good morning. Now we're going to take a brief little uphill here. There are one, two, three very old trees that date from about 1915 that were discovered or collected in North Carolina by John Dunbar, and they are a native silverbell, the mountain silverbell, Halesia monticola. And as you can see, they're, they're very elderly. They've had some dramatic pruning done. When we did the pruning last year, we um, disturbed a screech owl nest. We were very sorry about that. Turns out she came back though. But I want to show you the flower. The silver bell is exactly what you would think it is. It's a downward facing bell shaped flowers. Other places in the park, we have other silver bells that hail from Japan. Those are just starting to leaf out. 
So because this is native, it responds to the kind of heat that we've been having in Rochester over the last week and a half. We're going to keep on going uphill and head towards Rhododendron Valley. So, yeah. So I mentioned earlier that there are early season lilacs, mid-season, which is the Syringa vul vulgaris, which is where the bulk of the breeding has been done, and then late season. The late season hail from China and Japan, and this is a tree form, not a shrub of a lilac. It's Syringa reticulata, the Japanese tree lilac, and it has this beautiful peeling bark, cinnamon-colored peeling bark on the newer wood, and as it ages, it develops this craggly trunk. As you can see, this is a substantial trunk. This tree has been here for a very long time. And if you were to look at the flowering trysts, they're just coming on now, whereas the mid-season are reaching the end of their bloom. These will bloom right into June. And actually, the tree lilac is a very common street tree. It's used quite often. It seems to have a high tolerance for pollution. Once again, we're at one end of the lilac collection, but in the middle of this, in Rose Valley, is a very large collection of viburnum. All of our flowering shrubs, many of them members of the rose family, are found in beds that meander through the rose meadow, or rose valley, or rose hollow, depending on what you're reading. When Olmsted laid it out, it was referred to as Rose Hollow. And somewhere along the line, people writing about the park started calling it Rose Meadow, but it's all the same location. Now, you can see a huge swath of lilacs on this side. Those are the oldest and have rarely been pruned, and they reach 20 feet, which is not common for lilacs. As we walk into this dell, you'll notice there's a bank of evergreen trees, pines and hemlock, which provide shade to this turn in Highland Park. Also, because the pine trees shed their needles, it has acidic soil. So it's a perfect growing environment for rhododendrons and azaleas. We are now walking into rhododendron dell. Rhododendrons and azaleas are very similar. All azaleas are rhododendrons. Not all rhododendrons are azaleas because rhododendrons have leathery evergreen leaves and azaleas have deciduous, lighter, tend to be smaller and lighter leaves. But you'll see this big fat bud. These are just coming on. As we get into the dell, you'll see bright colors. Those are the azaleas who have been in bloom for a week now and we'll probably have another week of bloom before this heat will fade them. So you can see the difference. This is another rhododendron, but it has a very narrow lanceolate leaves. This is how we've come to have many hundreds of rhododendron varieties. We have about 75 represented in this collection because one of the park plantsmen, Richard Phoenicia, was a dedicated breeder and he particularly focused on rhododendrons and azaleas. This is a beautiful, and I can't tell you all their names because some of the labels are gone, but this is a beautiful yellow, which is fairly rare. And this is a beautiful example, and you can see the size of the buds that produce these flowers. Looking up, you'll see the hemlocks and the scotch pine and the white pine and the taxus baccata. All of those evergreens give us the shade we need for these plants to be successful. If you've ever planted a rhododendron in full sun, you've probably had the experience of it not surviving because these heavy evergreen leaves burn in full sun. You can see how the flowers form and form these beautiful balls of individual flowers. And right behind it is another ericaceous, meaning it grows in acidic loving soil, is the leucothoe, which is just starting to come into bloom. Those are its flower buds and you can see on this side, where there's a little more sun, they're a little further along, and you're starting to see the white little bell. That's a characteristic of Ericaceae family, is to have a bell-shaped flower. This is a Calmia latifolia. It's native to the Appalachian range, and it needs ericaceous soil, it needs good drainage, and it needs shade. They have fabulous flowers. You can just see the beginnings of the buds. 
but they open up in this round bud that has 10 stamens, which are the male flowering parts that tuck themselves in. And when it's ready to be pollinated, it bursts forward. It's just one of those great drama plants. Of course, you'd have to sit here with a slow motion camera for about a week and a half to see that, but somebody has done that because I've actually seen it. Also behind, you'll see the beautiful cinnamon bark of the paper bark maple which we have seen in other parts of the park. It is now fully leafed out. When we started um, our early spring tour, they were just starting to bud, but now we have full leaf. Two other plants that are part of this collection is you see the American redbud, Circus canadensis. It blooms before the leaves come out. And this is actually a fairly late bloomer. Many of our redbuds have already gone by. But this is a great example of how the flower buds line the stem all the way up. And that pink purple color, it also has varieties that are white. It's just, you can see it from a distance. It's that kind of pink. And then we are standing right next to a Chinese dogwood. This is the Cornus Cusa. And it's different from the American dogwood in that it blooms later. It starts to come into bud now and you can see the tiny buds and it will bloom at the end of May and into June and have these beautiful four petaled flowers and then in the fall it forms these red seeds this it's actually a droop that it's almost like a strawberry all the seeds are along the outside and then it's got a fleshy interior the other thing which is going to be hard to see but take a look when you have a chance the bark of the cornus cusa is mottled so it has that beautiful brown and tan coloring to it once it gets mature. So. Now we're coming into some of our azaleas. And azaleas, not religiously, but tend to flower before the leaves. So what you see here are these beautiful colored flowers and just the beginning of the leaves coming behind them. Whereas the rhododendrons need their leaves to form the buds, these buds are formed the season before. More azaleas, you can see the leaves coming on and the flowers fading. And then looking up at the top of the dell, you'll see larger versions of rhododendrons that have been left to reach their full mature size. I just want to make a plug for ground cover right now, as long as I have your attention. Um, underneath this Lakothaway, which is in the shade, and you can see its flowers are coming on is this wonderful planting that created itself here of American violets. They form a great understory ground cover that doesn't require us weeding or mulching. They become the living mulch. And I've become a huge fan of any native plant that will do the mulching for me. I showed you earlier the uh, Chinese dogwood, the Cornus Cusa. This is a hybrid. This is a cross between the American dogwood Cornus Florida and the Cornus Cusa, and you can see the white flowers and the seed heads. The uh, hybridization supported maintaining dogwoods in our population because there was a period when the American dogwood was being decimated by anthracnose. And this cross, many of them made at Rutgers University, helped preserve dogwoods in the landscape. Once again, we have this overstory of hemlock and a huge oak which is just starting to leaf out. The oaks are a later plant. We've seen a lot of plants that have leafed out, but you'll drive around the landscape now and you'll st still see bare naked trees. They're not dead. They're just, they take more growing degree days, more heat accumulation in the soil and in the plant system in order for those leaves to start pushing. I'm going to make a brief stop at this memorial rock. This is to um, Dick Phoenicia, Richard Phoenicia, who was our plant breeder. He actually served in the parks twice. When he was a young man, he was the propagator for about 15 years. And then he left the parks and came back in the 1950s and stayed until the end of his career. He was responsible over the course of his career with the parks for introducing many, many cultivars of azaleas, rhododendrons, lilacs and magnolias that he bred. I'm, not, I'm trying to remember them all. So off we go. Right across is a wonderful magnolia, which is a late bloomer. We visited the early spring flowering magnolias. This is the magnolia tripetala, and it's just starting to come into bloom. It's a large leafed magnolia, but this shows you its seed pod, the little pollinators in there. 
I'll leave them alone to their business. They have work to do. So now we're, we're moving from the rhododendrons into more sunlight. Um, I believe we stopped at the Parodia persica the last time we were here. This is also a member of the witch hazel family. Once again, this lovely mottled bark that you'll also see on the Cornus cusa. Very similar shaped leaves. Cordata, they're, they're not a lanceolate leaf, they're a broader leaf. And it has tiny, tiny red flowers in the early spring. This little guy, I, I think uh, volunteered here. It's a litter of Favagilla, which is also a member of the Hamamalis family. And um, I don't believe, it doesn't show up on our records as having been planted here. So it's what we would call a volunteer. I believe we talked last week about uh, the uh, raisin tree, Hovenia dulcis. Now, if we were at the bottom of this hill, you would see this scraggly tree that looks like it's dead, dominating the landscape. It is our raisin tree, and it is just now starting to leaf out. It is a native of Asia, and it's a very old tree, one of the oldest specimens of the Hovinia dulcis in America. There's a similar one at the Arnold Arboretum, about the same vintage. But why they call it the raisin tree is in late fall, it has almost looks like a cluster of grapes as fruit that then dry that look like raisins. People eat them and they're always sorry. They're always sorry. <laughs> So we're going to keep going. Some of the flowering shrubs are coming into bloom. Because we've had the seven degree weather, some of the earlier ones are coming. This is a mock orange that's just starting to come into bloom. It's beautifully shaded in here. Another great understory of lilacs. This is Shinomalis, which is the flowering quince. You'll notice they're further in because they bloom on two-year-old wood. This new growth won't bloom for two years. So it tends to be that the flowers are deeper in the plant because the new growth dominates and sort of obscures the flowers. We were talking about dogwoods. Straight in front of me is a pink flowering dogwood. And that is also a hybrid between Cornus Florida and Cornus Cusa. And it was bred to keep that pink color. Sometimes they'll open, the buds will be pink and then they'll open white. This particular tree is from the Rutgers series and it maintains its pink color. But I also want to point out this very large tree that's behind the dogwood. You can see the frame of it. That is another one of our legacy trees. It's the Japanese pagoda tree. And that tree has been here easily a hundred years. It's actually so old that the trunk is split in half and yet the tree survives. It is a summer blooming tree, so it is just starting to leaf out now. When I talk about legacy trees, I talk about some of the important trees that define Highland Park as a nationally ranked arboretum because we have trees that you really can't see in this size and in this condition most other places in America. The raisin tree is an example, our huge Sephora, the Katsura tree that we've talked about. Those are some of the legacy trees that we work very hard to maintain the health of. We're going to be heading down the hill and look over Rose Hollow, but we're stopping here at the pea shrub collection. And this is a small flowering shrub. They're in bloom now. Most of the plants along this southern facing hill from the reservoir, if you see the fence above us, we're standing right below the reservoir right now. They're members of the pea family and they have a very distinctive pea-shaped flower. This is their blooming season and then they have pea-like structures that come down. This is a native shrub. You'll notice there's a couple of red buds in here because they are members of the same family. This is another younger, smaller Sephora tree. And you can see it's just starting to leaf out, but it dominates this landscape. Many of the trees along the reservoir fence actually predate the planting of the park because the reservoir predates the park. So back to dogwoods, the Cornus family. This is a variegated Coosa dogwood. It's the Kristen Kusa dogwood, and as you can see, it has variegated leaves. And it is just starting its bloom. You can just see the sepals that are forming. This is a dwarf tree that has a weeping habit. And this is probably a 15-year-old tree, so it really is a dwarf species. Directly across is another dogwood. It's unusual in that most dogwoods 
have opposite leaves on the stem. The leaves emerge opposite each other. This is Cornus alternifolia, and it's called that because it has alternate leaves. The leaves come off alternate as opposed to coming directly across from each other. And it also blooms late, and you can see there's the blossom just starting. It's often called the wedding cake tree because of the way the flowers stack on top of the leaves. This will be in full bloom in another week or two, and there's several large specimens right here. Because we're in the pea family, Fabiaceae, the honey locust and the black locust, the glidizia and the robinia, they're all in the pea family. And they're late leaves, so you'll see that they're just starting to leaf out. Now, if you look up in this tree, you'll see the twisted pods, and I believe that's the glidizia which is the honey locust. And you distinguish the robinia from the glidizia based on the pods. And these are the twisted pods. They look like pea pods. Now here is another view into Rose Valley, Rose Meadow, Rose Hollow, which demonstrates the genius of Olmsted. When we were up top, you did not see this broad expanse of lawn where people really are picnicking and enjoying themselves. And all of the beautiful trees are planted around the edges to obscure the view. We have um, more red buds. And if you notice this one, the leaves are coming out this beautiful burgundy color. This is forest pansy. This is a hybrid that has these beautiful red leaves. This is the newest foliage is the deepest color burgundy and you can see just the tail end of the flowering cycle. Very popular in the trade. And here's an example of the seed pods from Circus. So when you see these in the landscape, you know you have a red bud long after the flowers are gone. Now this tree, this, this, so this is a red bud in front of it. It's a named variety. I want to say Allegheny Sweetheart, um, but don't quote me on that. And behind it is a golden chain tree. And it's called that because it has these dripping racemes of flowers, and it's just coming into flower now. And these will be P-shaped flowers on this long spike that heads down, and it's just, it glows. It's a beautiful tree. But this is one of the pea family that has the well-defined three leaflet leaf. Off to this side is a shrub collection, and when they're in bloom, they will just be covered with this arch of white. And they're called bridal veil because very often brides would carry them at their June wedding, which is when they bloom, right at the beginning of June. Another tree that is fairly late to leaf out is the Cotinus cogrigia, and we have a huge stand. Believe it or not, there's probably six different varieties of Cotinus in here but they're so happy and grow so well that they've all kind of grown together and it's going to be a big pruning effort. But you can see some of the variation with the red leaf and the green leaf, and you can just see the beginning of flowers. Now the Cotinus cugrigia is commonly known as smokebush, and I think you've probably seen it in the landscape. It's that shrub that, that has this fluff of white and yellow above it big flowers, big trysts of flowers that are really airy and they hang on for a month and they look like the trees on fire. They look like smoke rising from the leaves, which is how it got its common name. So we're going to head back down around and show you another view of Rose Valley and end up back near that Katsura that I've been talking about. This is a collection of flowering shrubs. This is the Rosa Rugoso. It's just starting to come into bloom. It's uh, the thorniest tree on the planet. It's horrible to prune, but there it is. And it has beautiful bright red rose hips in the fall. We have both golden and burgundy leafed nine bark, which is a common shrub. It actually benefits from severe pruning and, and this will happen sometime for this plant. We also have those Panicle hydrangeas. We're facing the southern hill and we're above the lilac collection and as we get closer as the hill drops off you see it even more so. More of the spirea. We have somewhere between 10 and 12 different varieties of spirea, golden leafed, um, red flower, pink flower, white flower, arching, upright. The varieties that are introduced are introduced because the flower form, the leaf, the shape of the plant, the season of bloom, all vary and and if they can establish that it's unique 
then they can introduce it to the trade, the breeders can. We have a lovely specimen kind of tucked back in here. It's like a perfect shape of an American holly. This is a native plant. It is um, an evergreen plant, so it keeps its leaves. You all are familiar with the holly we use at Christmas time with its thorny leaves. Hollies are male and female, so this happens to be a male. So because it doesn't get berries, nobody's ever chopped it up and taken pieces from it. So it has this almost perfect shape. Now this is a very thick thicket of bayberry and it's just starting to leaf out and you can see these are the beginnings of the flower buds. Bayberry is a, is a North American native and it spreads by clumps so you can see it has this very large clump. Bayberry has those white nodding flowers and it has a waxy coating on them and it's often used if you collect enough of those flowers to make candles with because it has that bayberry scent and you can smell in the leaves in the stems and in the flowers that bayberry scent this tree is near a path and its roots have been compromised by constant traffic here but it survives it sort of has leaned itself away from the path and if you look in, you can see where one branch has leaned on another and eventually a, a full graft has formed. It's just where a, a, a stem, a branch has leaned on somebody else and eventually they just get married and have babies and, you know, they're all union up. And it, they make for beautiful architecture of trees. Once again, we're looking out into the hollow. Right here is a bed of elderberries and the early flowering willow which is tricolored. And it's a small planting, but they get quite large. We try to introduce new varieties as we can. The problem with Highland Park is it's a very old park and there's just not very much room for new plantings. I do want to point out, this is a pin oak, Quercus palustris, and this oak is dedicated to George Alwanger, who was the nurseryman with Patrick Berry, who donated the original acreage for Highland Park. A very stately old tree, and directly behind it, that huge trunk you see is a willow. And because it's at the lowest point of Rose Valley, this is where the water collects. It has enough moisture to keep it growing. And you can see from the prune marks that it needs regular pruning because it's a very messy tree, but it's such a beautiful old trunk. And once again, looking south, we see the lilac collection. From this vantage point, we're now looking at Highland Avenue, you can see the full range of bloom on some of these trees, and it's really spectacular. There is right here a grove of probably a dozen amelanchier, which is the American service berry, and they bloom in early spring. But what's fabulous about them now is they've already bloomed, they've been pollinated by the earliest pollinators, and they will have these blue berries that the birds love and it becomes a place to do bird watching because you get such a variety of birds who visit all of these trees in order to eat. We have come around full circle back to the Katsura tree, but now we're viewing it from the pathway south. And you can see the double trunks and the snake light root system from all the traffic over the years of this plant. Now directly in front of it is a Chinese fringe tree. Um, the American fringe trees are just starting to leaf out. This one is already in leaf and will flower probably in another two weeks. But the fringe trees also have, actually there's one, they have a droop. They have um, a flower that's a bell, and then they have a single droop that is navy blue, and it's highly favored by the birds. So this is a popular bird tree. Now we're coming back around toward Rose Valley for another view looking up into the valley. And that huge tree that dominates is another pin oak. And that one does indeed predate the park. We, we, I've been able to substantiate that. But if you look in the horizon, you see one, two, three big pin oaks. So when Olmsted was here, he contoured the land in order to create these vistas using what was here. Now, at this juncture, south we have our lilacs and north we have the, the hydrangeas. 
And then if you follow the path up, you will wind your way around and find your way back to the Rhododendron Valley and the top of the hill. So we've made a circuitous circle from where we started. We are really just above the pansy bed. But this is a great view also of the kinds of flowers that the lilacs have. This very dense red form is actually a very tiny flower, but it's one of the most fragrant lilacs, and it's the lilac that's used for lilac perfume. Although the flowers aren't particularly spectacular, it makes up for it in fragrance. We've come full circle, and we're back in the lilacs. Highland Park is known for its lilacs, but it's so much more. Thank you for your time and attention, and um, come explore the park. You will always find something new. Come year-round. The dead of winter is actually one of the most exciting times to see this park, because then you see the structure and the architecture of the trees and the bark. Come visit us often. Thank you.